We add things to each other. Now, <clears throat> one of the things, one of the quick good paybacks of hypervisors is uh, CPU usage can be is shared because you have one set of CPUs, but they're being sh shared across multiple virtual machines, and so uh, there's more efficient usage of CPUs, and that's probably one of the reasons why people went to hypervisors in the in the early days. Of that. Okay, keeping that in mind, let's look at container virtualization. Now, it, in, in many senses, it is similar uh, in that you're running multiple workloads. But the difference here is you're running multiple workloads under a single instance of an OS. In the hypervisor scenario we looked at, there was each virtual machine had its own OS. So there were multiple instances of OS. Perhaps there was a, there was a guest I mean, a host operating system OS too, and top of that. Here, we just have a single instance of the OS, which is uh, hosting a container engine, and that that uh, instance is being multiplexed across all the containers. So the, each container here now sees its own OS, which is different from what we talked about earlier, where each VM was seeing its own hardware. So. Uh, uh, now, there, there are uh, controls uh, uh, in, in, in typical containers that, that uh, isolate the containers from each other. Uh, they're probably not quite as robust as a, in a VM scenario. Uh, there are also features typically in containers to allocate resources and dynamically move them between the various containers as needed. Uh, in order to make container virtualization happen, there are certain kernel modifications required, and we'll look at them. And containers themselves are not new. They've been around for a while. Uh, probably, if those of you coming from the Unix world uh, have probably seen forms of uh, containers in Solaris and HPUX. Uh, in the Linux world, uh, we have uh, LXC, which has uh, been in the, in the standard Linux kernel for since, I think, 2006. So it's been there almost 10 years. Uh, and then there are various uh, third-party products from Parallels, which provide container technology. Uh, and there's, uh, Google has done containers for a long time, and their technology is called LMCTFY, and that's a real cute name, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute. <laughs> so, uh, to, to depict pictorially what I just said, uh, here we have the hardware at the bottom, then we have the operating system, and a container engine. Now, in some cases, the container engine, the operating system, could be smushed into one. But uh, logically, there are two, two pieces here. And then the, I've depicted three containers. And notice there's only a single instance of the OS on the, in this configuration here. Uh, what, what's unique here is, even though there's a single instance of the OS, uh, the, the file systems, the user database, the the networking and the, and the process tree is unique for each container. So each container is, you know, if you want to look at process number 10 on container 1, it'll be different from, it'll be a different process than if there is a process number 10 on container 2. The, na na the, the namespaces are separated across the containers. Now containers are efficient for memory usage, mainly because now we've gotten rid of having an operating system per workload like we had in the virtual, virtual memory scenario. Uh, in, I'm sorry, in the virtualization scenario. And, and so uh, there's only a single instance of operating system, so all the resources the OS are con was consuming are now available for, for the workloads to, to actually use. <coughs> so uh, there have been a number of underlying Linux technologies that have been there for a long time that, are, that have uh, powered containers. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, much of these are aggregated to various extents in different implementations of container technology. Uh, we've already talked some about namespace isolation of the things listed over there. Uh, uh, of course, there's file system isolation too, so that uh, slash etsy slash hosts on one container does, is not the same as slash etsy hosts on, on any other container or on the host of OS. All, all of them are different. We'll look at the examples of that in, in the demonstration here. And then uh, Linux already has had for a while 
the concept of C groups, which essentially allows you to uh, uh, budget resources, control resources, such as memory, CPU, devices, etc., uh, and, and allocate them according to the needs of each workload to, to specific containers. So that, that technology has been around in Linux together. Now some, some implementation of container technologies, specifically Docker, uh, relies on uh, something called a copy and write file system. <coughs> so that if there, are two cop if there are two containers that perhaps are sh sharing the same file system, or let's say the, the host OS and the container sharing the file system, there are two copies of that file system. There's one, but it, when one, one is changed, the, 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 the one that's changed gets, only the files that get changed are, are kept in the copy and write file system. So space is used, spaces, file system space is efficiently allocated. So let's summarize. Uh, what's the difference between containers and virtual machines? Uh, containers are very lightweight. There is no operating system per container. Uh, the resources consumed are, are much less, uh, so as a result, you can support more workloads basically uh, on a, on a, than, than you could in a virtual machine environment. Because you have fewer resources, the, the, the boot time is just phenomenally better. A uh, typical virtual machine boosts in tens of seconds. Uh, a typical container starts up in tens of milliseconds, so you know, factor of 10 to the 3. Uh, and, uh, the performance is, in most cases, very near hard, uh, raw hardware performance uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, CPU, memory, etc. <clears throat> and because you have only one instance of the OS, it's easier to manage. Now, that's a blessing and that's a curse too. And the curse that it, it is is because you have one instance of the OS, if you need to do any radical surgery on the OS, all your containers have to come down. If you need to reboot your, do a true reboot, uh, you've got to take all your containers down. Uh, and then uh, the fact that there's only one underlying OS means you can only run containers that uh, speak that general flavor of OS. When I say general flavor of OS, I mean the container can, if, if it's a Linux flavor, any Linux flavor pretty much, uh, you can run a Linux container on it, uh, but you can't run a Windows container. They don't exist yet, but someday they will. Uh, you, uh, you don't exist. You, you, you can't run a Windows container on a Linux system, or vice versa. If you one day Windows, one day Windows will have a container engine, and you won't be able to run Linux containers on that either. So how do, how do these containers and VMs uh, play together? Well, they co they co coexist real well. Uh, I think depending on what you're doing, one or the other or both may be the right answer. Uh, VMware, for example, has, has heavily pushing something, uh, uh, I forget the name of their project, it comes up on another slide, where they're actually building uh, Docker containers inside of VMware VMs, in that sense, and, and are promoting it. In that sense. So, uh, we talked about containers in general, let's talk about what's different about Docker. As I said, it's a specialized kind of container, and the focus here basically shifts. Whereas the con containers in general tend to be uh, associated with giving you almost an entire operating system image. So the container will have, uh, you can log into it and you can't tell that it isn't a, a full-fledged operating system running on native hardware or on a VM. It, you know, all the demons that you typically see will be running, etc. Uh, the difference here in Docker is the goal is to provide a, an application-centric view of containers. The goal is to make it easy to, to develop applications, move them from development to QA to production, etc., uh, without having to change too many things, containing all the dependencies that the application needs, and, and only those things that the application needs inside of the container. And uh, so, uh, the, 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 the whole focus is getting applications into production quickly, modifying applications, and, and whereas uh, the, the uh, virtual machines tended to te uh, tend to run, or even, even Linux con uh, LXC containers tend to run for long periods of time, uh, these lightweight application-centric containers like Docker uh, 
may run for milliseconds and then it'll start up, do its task, exit. And then start up, do its, ta start, do its exit. So it's not consuming any resources when it isn't doing work. Allowing you to uh, think of re-architecting your application in a way that it consists of all these microservices, which is the direction where we're hearing in a lot of talks here today, using microservices to put applications together. <coughs> Now, just to help you understand the problem that it's, uh, c the containers are solving is, uh, when you look at, on the left here, we have an array of applications. And these applications uh, 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 typically uh, perform various functions, may work together with each other in, in, a, in a typical shop. The horizontal axis has the places where these applications may run. They may run on a, on a, on a workstation of a developer, uh, and that developer may, may hand off a piece of that to, the other, to his friend across the, uh, the office there who's going to do another piece of that. So it'll run on his, his environment in his workstation or her workstation. Uh, and then eventually, when they got it all figured out, it'll go into QA, so it moves into a QA environment. And then from there, it may be moved into production, uh, or there may be a number of intermediate steps. And that's sort of what the horizontal axis is, is indicating here. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, how often have you heard, it works in my environment, but it, it won't, if somebody else says it, it doesn't work in theirs, but <laughs> you just move the code over. Well, what, what are the types of things that break? There are lots of things that could break. Could be the version of libraries that are, that are present, Certain utilities and tools are present one place, not present the other place. There, there may be certain configuration files that are set up one way here and not a different way there. There may be uh, environment variables that are, that are set one way or not set and, and differently in the others. So there are lots of other things like that that could cause things to say to work one place, but when you pick up the code and drop it somewhere else, it doesn't work. So that's, that's the problem we're trying to solve, allow you to move all these things and yet, yet have it work and, and, and do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a real concise manner, just taking just what you need for that application and no more of, uh, in, in, over to, from one, uh, develop, one execution environment to another execution environment. So uh, the problem, is, as computer scientists would call, this is an n-squared problem basically trying to figure out if, I, if I'm moving this application to this environment, then you've got to do these, these things. And moving to that environment, you've got to do these, these things. So you, you have essentially N squared uh, formula, lists of things, tasks that have to be performed depending on which piece of software is going where. Uh, that's not very easy to manage. Uh, now, uh, this, this problem is not unique to a computer world. In the, in the shipping industry, essentially, many years ago, this was the same issue. Uh, you had, on the, on the one hand, you know, uh, per, perhaps a, a bunch of bananas being shipped, uh, and, and, and then on the other hand, you had automobiles being shipped. And depending on where they were, what was the mode of transportation, there were different instructions on how you packed them uh, and, and made, them suit, uh, uh, made them ready to be transported by the medium of transportation in that sense. Uh, so when you move, change between one place, one mode of transportation to another, then you have to remove move things around and repackage things. And how did the transportation industry solve this? They came up with the concept of, of you know, physical containers. And, and basically, what this did was it allowed those who are shipping something to only worry about getting whatever they're shipping into the container and pack properly. Uh, they don't have to worry about what else is, is shipping. And so that's the only task that they have. Whereas the, the people who are in the transportation industry that are moving the stuff, now the only thing they have to worry about is, here's a standardized container. How do I pick it, move it from here to there? And they don't have to repack things or worry about uh, you know, the, the, the automobile crushing the bananas you know, in transit, etc. Because these containers will easily stack on top of each other and, and, and uh, essentially take away that problem. Uh, so uh, <laughs> Docker, in a sense, does the same thing. It eliminates this matrix from hell by, by essentially requiring the developer of the application 
to ensure that all the bits and pieces that are needed for the application are stuffed inside the Docker container. And, and he doesn't have to worry about how that application gets moved between one place and installed on, on a production system, QA system, developer one system, developer two system, whatever. Uh, whereas the, the sysadmin now doesn't have to worry about these long lists of this application going in this environment, you need to do this, this, this. All he has to do is, I'm getting a standard container, I have a container engine, how do I run th this standard container on my container engine? That's all he has to know basically. So it simplifies that this task of managing uh, application deployments greatly. <clears throat> so I uh, talked about Docker. I talked about LXC containers. So what's the just to remember? Uh, remind me. Remind us what the what the highlight where where Docker specializes compared to LXC containers. The focus is the important thing. Whereas one is focused on providing a full operating system image kind of. Thing, the Docker is now giving you a single application typically uh, running within one container. Uh, and just the libraries, just the pieces that are needed for that application. So uh, the, the OS template needed for that within the container is pared down. There, there, there typically will not be things such as uh, you know, the init daemons running, syslog, cron, etc. unless they're needed by that application. There's no need to have those things running inside the Docker container. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, uh, containers could be long-lasting, but very typically in this view of the world as being uh, serviced by micros microservices, is really uh, typically short-lasting. You know, maybe of the order of um, seconds, typically, before the container's, uh, 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 you know, task is done and the container is goes away. Uh, Again, we talked about applicable portability. Uh, one other thing that Docker app provides is uh, a, a, like a repository, and uh, I think they call it a registry, where, where they, where they save all, where, where they make available images that can be used to start containers. So you might have an image which, ha which has, uh, say, Ubuntu 14.04 uh, LTS on it. And just just the, a skinny version of that. Uh, you might have an image which has just enough Linux to run Nginx uh, as a as a web server, etc., etc. And so uh, once you have built these these uh, uh, specialized images, they could be shared either in within your organization and have a local repository, or on the on the worldwide internet where there are, uh, you know lots and lots of uh, images that people make available. Of course, you have to trust. Uh, there's a question of whose, whose images can you trust? Those things that you have to worry about. Okay. So the Docker architecture is actually quite simple. Uh, there is typically a host with where all the Docker containers are running, and that host has a Docker daemon on it. Uh, the and, and the first function of that Docker daemon is actually to execute commands that are given to operate on the containers, which could be start up a container, stop a container, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, how does one uh, issue these commands? How does one interact with, with, the, doc with the Docker host? Uh, there's something called a Docker client, and, and, and that could be either running on the same machine as the Docker host, or it could be running on another machine on the network. Uh, typically, when it's running on the same machine, it, there's a CLI, and I'll be demonstrating these CLI commands uh, shortly. Docker pull, Docker run, Docker ps, etc., etc., to to cause the Docker Docker uh, daemon or the Docker engine to do the right things uh, that you want done. Uh, in the case of remote access, there's there's RESTful APIs available essentially to do the same thing, uh, and I believe even the local access. Uh, essentially uh, takes these CLI commands and boils them down to RESTful APIs and makes a call back to the Docker daemon that uh, you don't have to worry about writing to those APIs. And then on the side, as I mentioned, there is a registry. A registry is basically a, a collection of images of useful things that people have done that you may want to reuse. And so uh, 
the main thing, one of the main things in the darker world is you, you don't often start from scratch. You start with some, some image that does 80% of what you, what you need done, and then you write the code to do the remaining 20%, and out of that you may generate another image uh, which can be shared with others who may then take that and enhance it to their specific needs. So that there's an image repository which Docker calls a registry. Uh, so, d what's the Docker ecosystem look like? This is just a very simple thing. Uh, at, at, at the top, you have, uh, oh, let's start at the bottom. At the bottom, you have all the places where Docker can run. And it can run on physical machines, it can run on, on virtual machines, it can run on clouds, uh, and, and there are various uh, providers of, 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 of uh, virtual, you know, in the, in the cloud that that support Docker, some of them are listed here, and uh, there are various uh, operating systems in the, in the Linux community which have Docker built into it, built into them, and they, they can uh, enable you to run, run Docker uh, on them. The, uh, on the application side, of, of, on, on the top half of this slide, uh, are a lot of uh, utilities and tools, uh, some of which are embeddable inside of Docker containers, and some of which are used to manipulate Docker containers. So a lot of the, you, you may notice a number of the configuration management tools like uh, Chef and Puppet and Ansible are, 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 are integrated into the Docker ecosystem here. Uh, so if you, if you, where, where, do you, where do you want, if you want to run Docker, where, where would you go? Well, get hold of a, of a fairly recent Linux distribution and I have some listed there and they have Docker built into them. Uh, so there's almost nothing you have to do, just install those things. If, if Docker, uh, docker.io is typically the name of the package, at least it says on the Ubuntu family of systems, uh, you may need to do apt-get install docker.io. Maybe, maybe your distribution already has that. <coughs> uh, now, you, now, there are people who are saying, uh, just like VMware took uh, what used to be a host, a general purpose host operating system with their uh, hypervisor sitting on top and smoosh that and put, put a specialized operating system uh, good for hypervisor functionality and call it ESX. Uh, why not do the same thing in the Docker world? Build something that will boot on raw, raw hardware that can, whose only function is not to support general purpose application but support containers and container management basically. And in that, in that way, there are, uh, there's a company called CoreOS that is doing a significant amount of work producing a, a product in that line. Uh, Red Hat is working on something called Project Atomic, which is, again, in the same way, producing a slim Linux-like OS on which Dockers can run. Uh, and then VMware has, done, has something called Photon, which is, again, in the same way, basically. <coughs> Now, what about non-Linux OSs? If, what if, as I said today, Docker is very Linux-centric. Uh, if you want to run a Linux Docker container on a Mac OS system or a Windows system, well, essentially, you can use tools like uh, something called Docker Toolbox. Uh, what that essentially does is it gives you a VM, uh, and I, th I think it uses a, a virtual box, so it gives you a VM which is essentially running a skimmed down version of an OS that knows how to manage containers. So you, you will be then working inside this Linux, skimmed down Linux OS which is booted in this VM onto your Windows box or your Mac OS box. And then you can have Docker-like functionality. Uh, we'll talk about native functionality for Windows later. <coughs> Now, in, 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 the, in the cloud, there are multiple cloud providers listed there that already have all the mechanics needed to support containers. Uh, OpenStack, which is, which is again, a, a cloud hypervisor solution uh, from, the, from the open source community, also uh, as of almost 18 months ago, has Docker integrated into, into its Havana release, and, and, and the level of integration is increasing every six months as they come out with new releases. We'll talk about Windows Server later. Oh, there it is, so we'll talk about it now. Uh, uh, so what, what's happening here is uh, 
Azure, uh, today you can go to Microsoft's cloud and you can run Linux uh, uh, VMs on which you can run Docker containers. That's available today. Uh, now, in the future, where Microsoft is committed to going is uh, building in uh, con container technology in general. All those things I listed that were needed to support containers that have been in Linux for you know six to ten years. All that functionality has to appear in the window in the Windows world. And that they're working on that. At some future release, uh, they will they will have essentially a Docker engine that runs on, on Windows Server, which will then be able to run Windows Docker containers uh, with, on that Docker Windows engine. That will not be able to run Linux containers. So, it's Windows containers run on a Windows Docker engine, Linux containers run on a Linux Docker engine. Now, it, this is a particularly challenging uh, task for Microsoft because, of, in my opinion, some poor design decisions they made in how they built Windows. You know, this, this uh, awful thing called a registry is, is going to make them life a nightmare trying to get that figured out in this environment. <laughs> okay, uh, are, there are a number of tools showing up from third parties in, in, in terms of uh, graphical manipulation. All I'll be demonstrating today is command line, uh, but uh, there's also uh, orchestration tools which are getting rich, which means all I'd be showing you is starting a single container. When you have a whole host of containers working together, talking over the network with each other to solve some issue, you need some tools to manage all that. Uh, Kubernetes is a very good tool that is maturing in that area. In fact, I just came out the previous hour for a talk on Kubernetes. Uh, so uh, if you missed that, try and get the slides. It's, it's a really useful tool. It is done by Google and it's being uh, contributed to the open source world. Uh, where's Docker being used? Uh, well, I'm from HP, and I, I can tell you, within our own corporate IT world, we have people developing lots of apps using D Docker. It's, 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 it's still in the development phase. Our corporate IT has, has developed, a, uh, has pr provided us a registry whereby developers can tick containers that may be useful to others and make them available in that registry so they can be shared within the corporation. So this is a private registry. Uh, one of the apps that's being moved over is the internal, we have an internal directory app where you can find out uh, information about people who work and where they work and who their boss is and all that stuff. Now, uh, uh, many, many other players like eBay, Spotify are, are primarily using Docker in, in the role of making it easy to move applications from the uh, development world into the QA world and the test world and solving the problems we've been talking about. Uh, and, and they're in various stages of, of uh, testing and deployment of Docker in these worlds. Now I'll talk a little bit about Google LMCTFY. Now strictly speaking, this isn't Docker, but it is Google's version of equivalent functionality which uh, they have done long before Docker existed. So they've been doing this for years, but it isn't strictly Docker. But it, it's close enough that we can learn some things from it. Uh, what does LMCTFY stand for? Does anybody know? Let me containerize that for you. Okay, you hear that? It says, let me containerize that for you. Their, their whole worldview is moving as much as possible to the container world. And, and, and they've been quite successful in that. They, they say now that all the services they provide today are done via containers. Uh, that includes search, that includes mail, that includes uh, their Google Docs, etc. All that, and whenever you use those, you're using containers in, in their back end there. Uh, they, they say that they, st they start over 3,000 containers every second, uh, which means over 2 billion containers a week. Now, obviously, these are probably very long, short-lived containers. It, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if the architecture is, you know, every time you issue a Google search, there's a new container fired off to service that one search. And then once it's done, it's gone. And the next time you issue a search, a new container fires off. So the lifetime of the container may be seconds or so. Uh, that's my guess, but I don't know. So if you want to learn Docker, where do you go? Well. 
Docker used to have a really nice uh, website where you could go on the web without installing any software on a machine and play with Docker. Fortunately, I, you know, I, I, and I've talked about it in previous places, I've, I've played with it a lot. Uh, I, I, I had it on my slide and then I tested it two days ago and it's gone. That website is gone. Don't ask me why. So you've got to get installed somehow. Uh, you better get a Linux OS that has the Docker packages on it or you go to run it on